Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. Thank you for attending today's study. I look forward to your input. I look forward to your comments. Before we begin the study, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we may understand more clearly that which is currently before us. Be with us and guide us in all of these things. So shall we now ask his blessing at this time. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for these opportunities that we have to come before you, especially for the opportunities we have in these Sabbath hours. Father, we ask now for your guidance. We need your guidance because we need your direction and we need your wisdom. We thank you, Father, for these opportunities that we have to assemble with like-minded believers. Help us now, Father, guide us in all things so that your will may be done. We ask, Father, that your angels may attend us, that your spirit may be with us as well. Help us to honor the Sabbath, which you have created. Direct us in all things that are said and done. I ask, Father, that you hide me behind your cross. Help me today so that it is your words and not mine that are spoken. Be with us now in all things. For those that are here at this meeting, for those that will view this later, may your will be done. May your character and your name be glorified. For this we ask, for this we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, my voice may be a bit weak today. For that, I apologize. There may be some times that I may ask for others to read. So be prepared. We're going to recap just briefly some items that we talked about last Sabbath. Now, in Manuscript 63 of 1897, which is an unpublished manuscript, we read that God has declared in his word that the seventh day is a sign between him and his chosen people, a sign of their loyalty. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them and hollow my Sabbaths. And they may be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Ezekiel 20, 19 and 20. If the Sabbath is accepted, the rest of the commands in the Decalogue will be obeyed. For no one can truly keep the Sabbath and disregard one precept of the law. How have, how have we come to understand this statement? How have we come to accept this statement? What do you mean come to accept it? Do we not often state that if you break one, you have broken them all? Mm -hmm. Oh, so, so the idea here that, that all the law is one. Correct. Yeah. Well, I mean, that comes from James, but, but it's also the whole concept of that the first four represent our love to God and the last six represent our love towards man. And, you know, you can't, it, it would seem pretty obvious that you, you, you can't just keep part of your duty to man and demonstrate love to man. But yet, 
how often do we find this exactly happening? Well, all the time. But those, you know, you couldn't do that if you believed God's word. Correct. Now, Ezekiel 20. Is this yet part of Ezekiel's second vision, or is this the beginning of his third? I mean, this is something we've studied multiple times. <clears throat> is Ezekiel in this vision reinforcing our need to examine for ourselves and accept for ourselves the experience of the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt? Well, Ezekiel here is quoting Exodus. Right. Right. So he's quoting Exodus 31. And um, so this, this section here uh, dealing with the Sabbath. So it's 31 13. It's talking about the seventh day Sabbath. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, uh, Truly my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it shall be. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Now, of course, he Ezekiel quotes that in verse 12 more directly. And, um, uh, and then he quotes it again, though, with a little bit different ending in verse 20 of Ezekiel 20. Um, and... Then, uh, so that's also in 3117. Right. It says, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth. And on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So here we have also um, the symbol of of God resting. And so right. this really reminds us of Hebrews uh, chapter 4, um, where Paul, Paul talks about, well, here he's talking about entering into the rest from the symbol of the promised land. But he also refers to, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, he says in verse 10, for he that has entered into his rest he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. So he's obviously referring back to the original day of creation. And that's why he says in the verse before Hebrews 4, 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. And that word rest is sabbatismus, right? So in this whole idea of the Sabbath, it's ceasing from our own works. That is, He's the one that sanctifies us. Without God's sanctifying work in our lives, uh, we can't keep any of his law. Does anyone have a difficulty with what Brother Theodore has just presented here? <clears throat> Are we in agreement with this? <clears throat> Yes. Okay. Now I note <clears throat> I note from the chat that the comment is made that Ezekiel 20 has I lifted up my hand unto them many times. Has God reminded the literal children of Israel and his spiritual children of Israel many times of the need to take him at his word, just as it reads. Amen. All who have intelligence 
and a knowledge of the scriptures are without excuse in regard to the day which God has enjoined upon man. From the pillar of cloud, Christ constantly set before his church in the wilderness the requirements of God. And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep them and do them. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. We're being shown that our Heavenly Father, our Creator, our Savior, are serious that we understand His character. Would you agree with that statement? Here we are shown again, from the pillar, Christ constantly set before his church the requirements of God. How else is God to teach his children if he is not consistent in what he has to say to us? How are we to learn if God is not consistent? Now, the next statement is very telling. The Lord often tested his people to see if they would have faith in him. <clears throat> How do you take this? How many times do we see others when they are being tested, when they are going through the fire of affliction, when some issue comes up that they don't expect? Are they crying to be having this issue taken away? Yet what does scripture tell us? What are we to do in situations like this? Are we not to praise him in all things, whether it be good or whether it be a test? Amen. Okay. The Lord allowed the supply of water to fail, that the Israelites might be reminded of their past deliverance. And be led to put their trust in God. <clears throat> How often are we. Willing to praise God. When tests befall us. When issues that seem to have no resolution. Are presented before us. But their continual blessings, for which they should have been ever grateful, led them to forget their dependence. Are we to forget God, or are we to remember and praise him for the way in which he has led us in the past? Are we to question the wisdom of God, thinking that our wisdom is greater than his? That man knows more than his creator? <clears throat> no sooner did their supply of water fail than they forgot God, and they blamed Moses as the cause of their calamity.
Isn't this the condition of man? Man forgets God. We tend to blame somebody else. Did we not see this in the Garden of Eden? Did we not see this with Elijah? Did we not see this continually through the history of the children of Israel and into the times of the New Testament? Was Moses the cause of their calamity? How no. Safe? Okay. No, they were being yeah, they were being tested. <clears throat> Did they remember God at the time when the water failed? No, they didn't. They forgot. In the place of trusting God, who had so long and so liberally supplied their wants, they gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron and bitterly reviled them for bringing them out of Egypt. <laughs> Have we not been in a similar situation since July 18th of 2020? Yes, that, uh, that has been the case. How easily this unbelief springs into life. Are we to trust in ourselves or are we to trust in God? Are we to trust in man, the creation, or are we to trust in our creator? Because when it comes to unbelief, this is our danger today. If we want to believe <clears throat> that everything is now dependent upon one man returning to power in the United States, then are we not saying that our trust is not in God? Are we not stepping on enchanted ground? <clears throat> the people of God must keep a continual watch over their hearts, lest they allow Satan to interpose between them and God. Who do you want today as your mediator? Because if one is interposing, if one is standing between yourself and God, do you not want Christ as such a mediator? Or are you by faith and lack of faith allowing Satan to take his place? And that's a hard statement. <clears throat> Often physicians are called upon the Sabbath to minister to the sick, and it is impossible for them to take time for rest and devotion. The Savior has shown us by his example that it is right to relieve the suffering on this day, but physicians and nurses should do no unnecessary work. Ordinary treatment and operations that can wait should be deferred until the next day. Let the patients know that physicians must have one day for rest. The Lord says, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. <laughs> is this part of Exodus incumbent upon us today. Are we to learn 
from the experience of the children of Israel. <clears throat> yes, because uh, that's an example for us. Amen, brother. <clears throat> Let no man, because he is a physician, feel at liberty to disregard this word of the Lord. He should plan his work so as to obey God's requirements. He should not travel on the Sabbath except where there is real suffering to be alleviated. When this is the case, it is not a desecration of the Sabbath for physicians to travel upon that day. But ordinary cases should be deferred. <clears throat> How often do people feel at liberty to disregard plain statements of Scripture? And it doesn't just mean a physician. How often does this happen? <laughs> Mrs. White had several points that she looked to make to stress over and over and over again what should be done when people are feeling at liberty. Letter 8, 1863, written to a brother Sawyer. I've been meaning to write you for some time, but have been so busily engaged writing for testimony number nine that I've not had the opportunity to write to you. I was shown some things in regard to you. I saw that you have something to do. You believe the truth, but you get fanciful views of scripture and talk out these ideas which your mind has run upon, which have injured your efforts in the Sabbath school. You must restrain your mind upon this point. The plain chain of truth has been dug out and presented in publications and from the desk. <clears throat> in reading and studying the scriptures, you are in danger of getting a fanciful understanding of them, original views of your own which do not harmonize with the faith of the body. In reading and explaining the scriptures, you should be very careful not to depart from the expressed and established views which have been given by those in the faith who have sought for truth as for hid treasure who have endured any labor and spared no expense, who have in the fear of God presented a harmonious chain of truth. Now, what, how, do you, how do you approach this? How do you see this? If we have issues of things <clears throat> that are being presented. And we think that we have a better idea. <clears throat> I recognize that we are all to come together and study. But if these ideas are so fanciful, are so different from the harmonious chain of truth, the plain chain of truth. The 1843 and the 1850 charts. Are we to stand thinking that we know better than that which has been ordained by the hand of God? <clears throat> I saw, Brother Sawyer, that your inclinations to be rather fanatical injured your usefulness and placed you where it was unsafe for you to bear any great responsibility in the church. 
I saw that you are in danger and must guard yourself on every side or the enemy will take great advantage of you. You feel a zeal for the truth. And there would not be any special danger in this zeal if you did not let it carry you too far. You get some fanciful views and interpretations of scripture and get very animated upon them and lead minds in the wrong direction. There is enough plain scripture truth for young and old to safely dwell upon with profit. And you should more closely confine yourselves to the explanation of those scriptures which have been dug out and the body settled upon their meaning. And then you would not raise a controversy or cause a jangle in the feelings of your brethren. <clears throat> you must restrain the disposition within you of being original. You must lean upon the faith of the body or you will mar the work of God and injure the truth. No new views should be advocated by preachers or people upon their own responsibility. All new ideas should be thoroughly investigated and decided upon. If there is any weight in them, they should be adopted by the body, if not rejected. Unless there is order in these things, there would soon be a great confusion in our ranks. It is not in the order of God for one to feel at liberty to express his views independent of the body, and another express his, and so on. <clears throat> if such a course should be taken, we should not all speak the same things and with one mind glorify God. All of us have a part to act, but it is union within the body. You could be of use in the church if you would get rid of the tendency there is in you to be a little fanatical, to let your mind run too much to the fanciful. Now, comment was made from the chat. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. Why? speaks about the carnal mind as opposed to the mind of God. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We should ask God to rule our minds. If God is not ruling our mind, who is ruling it? Satan and our carnal. Is that what we are called to do, is to, to allow our adversary to rule over us? From Manuscript 6, <clears throat> 1866. We find the following. Some have felt at liberty through envious feelings to speak out lightly at battle, of Battle Creek. Some look suspiciously on all that is going on there and seem to exult if they can get a hold of anything to take advantage of what comes from Battle Creek. But God is displeased with such a spirit, such a course of action. From what source do churches abroad obtain their light and knowledge concerning the truth? It has been from the means which God has ordained, which centers at Battle Creek. Who have the burdens of the cause? It is those who are zealously laboring at Battle Creek. Now, while churches that are scattered abroad are relieved from the burdens and the heavy trials, which necessarily come upon those who stand in the forefront of the battle, and while they are excused from the perplexities of wearing thought 
attendant upon those who engage in making important decisions in connection with the work to be accomplished for the remnant people of God. They should feel thankful and praise God that they are thus favored and should be the last to be envious, jealous, fault-finding, occupying a position, report, and we will report it. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, since January, or excuse me, since July 18th of 2020, since January 6th of 2021, we have seen envy, jealousy, fault finding that has come throughout this movement. The statements that we've been reading the last couple of weeks from Scripture whether from the book of Joel or the book of Zechariah, have a theme that we have been examining. And what is that theme, if you care to remember? Here is Zechariah again. At the very opening of the book of Zechariah, how, how did the translators view this? What do the translators present as being the theme right from the initial verse of the book of Zechariah? Are we not being exhorted to repentance? Are we not being shown the need that we have for the upper room experience? How do we assume we're ever going to give a message to the world to the church if we are not united. Isn't this the way that the disciples gave their message? Now, are we to have envious feelings against any other brother or sister? Yes or no? No. Okay. No. The church at Battle Creek has borne the burdens of the conferences which have been, upon many, or nearly all, a severe tax. Many, in consequence of the extra hours or the extra labors borne, have brought upon themselves debility, which has lasted for many months. They have borne the burden cheerfully, but have felt saddened and disheartened by the heartless indifference of some and the cruel jealousy of others after they have returned to the several churches from whence they came. Speeches are thoughtlessly made by some, designedly by others, concerning the burden bearers there and concerning those who stand at the head of the work. God has marked all these speeches, all these jealousies, and all these envious feelings, and a faithful record is kept of it all. <clears throat> Do we want to come before the judgment bar of God 
and be reminded of the backbiting, of the envy, of the jealousy, of the offhand words that tore and hurt others that were faithfully working. Men and women thank God for the truth and then turn around and question and find fault with the very means heaven has ordained to make them what they are or what they ought to be. How much more pleasing to God for them to act the part of Aaron and her and hold up the hands of those who are bearing the great and heavy burdens of the work in connection with the cause of God. Murmurers and complainers should remain at home where they will be out of the way of temptation, where they cannot find food for their jealousies, for their evil surmisings, and for their fault finding, for the presence of such is only a burden to the meetings, clouds without water. All who feel at liberty to censure and find fault with those whom God has chosen to act as an important part in this last great work had better be converted and obtain the mind of Christ. Let them remember that those of the children of Israel who were ready to find fault with Moses, whom God had ordained to lead his people to Canaan, and to murmur against even God himself. They should remember that all these murmurers fell in the wilderness. It is so easy to rebel, so easy to give battle, before considering matters rationally, calmly, and settling whether there is anything to war against. The children of Israel are our examples upon whom the ends of the world are come. <clears throat> Brethren and sisters who have, been, have removed from Rome to this church are too excitable, too ready to decide, too ready to give battle where there is nothing to war against. They need to encourage a calm, reflective mind, <clears throat> a reason for, to be able to reason from cause to effect, and not be in haste to make decisions. They must learn much in order to be a benefit to the church in right. Throughout this, Mrs. White is being very clear. We need to be walking in the old paths. <clears throat> we need to walk upon the firm foundation. We are not here to tear apart the foundation. We are here to examine it, to understand it, and to go forward. I saw the wives of ministers. Some of them were of no help to their husbands. Yet they profess the third angel's message. They think more of studying their own wishes and pleasure than the will of God or how they can hold up their hands of their husband by their faithful prayers and careful walk. I saw that some of them take so willful and selfish a course that Satan makes them his instruments and works through them to destroy the influence and usefulness of their husbands. They feel at liberty to complain and murmur if they are brought through any straight place. They forget the sufferings of the ancient Christians for truth's sake and think that they must have their wishes and their way and follow their own will. 
They forget the suffering of Jesus, their master. They forget the man of sorrows who was acquainted with grief. He who had not where to lay his head. They do not care to remember that holy brow pierced with a crown of thorns. They forget him who bearing his own cross to Calvary fainted beneath its burden. Not merely the burden of the wooden cross, but the heavy burden of the sins of all of the world was upon him. They forget the cruel nails driven through his tender hands and feet and his expiring agonizing cries, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? After all this suffering endured for them, they feel a strong unwillingness to suffer for Christ's sake. Is this the position that we find ourselves in today? <clears throat> okay. A comment from the chat. One with which I heartily agree. It is really terrifying. There are many, very many obstacles by which we may fail to reach God's standard, just as the Israelites in the wilderness. We should keep praying to be saved by God's grace. Are we only to pray? Uh, we are to study the word and also put it in practice so that uh, we attain righteousness. Agreed. If we are unwilling to put it into practice, then are we being faithful? And the answer in the chat is no. There are persons I saw, these persons I saw, are deceiving themselves. They have no part nor lot in the matter. They have hold of the truth, but the truth has no hold of them. When the truth, the solemn, important truth, gets a hold of them, self will die. Then the language will not be, I will go there, I cannot stay there, here. But the earnest inquiry will be, where does God want me to be? Where can I best glorify him? And where can our united labors do the most good? Their will should be swallowed up in the will of God. The willing, willfulness and lack of consecration that some of the minister's wives manifest will stand in the way of sinners. The blood of souls will be upon their garments. Some of the ministers have borne a strong testimony in regard to the duty and of the wrongs of the church, but it has not had its designed effect, for their own companions needed all the straight testimony that had been borne, and their reproof came back upon themselves with great weight. <clears throat> they let their companions affect them and drag them down, prejudicing their minds and their usefulness and their influence are lost. They feel desponding and disheartened and realize not the true source of the injury. It is close at home. These sisters are closely connected with the work of God. If he has called their husbands to preach and present the truth, these servants, if truly called of God, will feel the importance of the truth. They are standing between the living and the dead and must watch for souls as they that must give an account. Solemn is their calling and their companions can be a great blessing or a great curse to them. 
They can cheer them when desponding, comfort them when they're cast down, and encourage them to look up and trust fully in God when their faith fails. Or they can take an opposite course and look upon the dark side, think that they're having a hard time, and exercise no faith in God. They talk of their trials and their unbelief to their companions, indulging a complaining, murmuring spirit, and to be a dead weight and even a curse to them. How often do we see this? How often does this occur within the church and within the movement? One of the things that I remember well were the conversations that I had with Elder Jeff and Sister Kathy. Elder Jeff was very clear in many presentations, how many times he was being called to give a message and to be away from his home. How much he truly loved Sister Kathy was very evident in their communication and in everything that they did. Sister Kathy spent a lot of time holding up Elder Jeff's hands as he labored so faithfully on our behalf. Throughout this, how many times did we ever give thanks for the ministry of both Elder Jeff and Sister Kathy? <clears throat> I saw that the wives of the ministers should help their husbands in their labors and be exact and careful what influence they exert, for they are watched, and more is expected of them than of others. Their dress should be an example. Their lives and their conversation should be an example, savoring of life rather than of death. How many times, brothers and sisters, are we finding others that are giving their advice? Oh, well, your dress is too severe. Your dress is, it, it, just, it, it just isn't according to the modern fashion. How do you ever expect to find a husband? How do you expect to keep a man if you're going to dress in the old ways? If you're going to accept the health message? What did we see after those that attended the meeting in Germany that came out so directly in saying that the sisters should take off their dresses and begin wearing pants. What have we heard from them? What have we seen from them? What kind of a witness are they being at this time? I saw that they should take a humble, meek, yet exalted stand, <clears throat> not having their conversation upon things that do not tend to be direct in the, to direct the mind heavenward. The great inquiry should be, how can I save my own soul and be the means of saving others? I saw that no half-hearted work in this manner is accepted of God. You cannot have one foot in the world and one foot in heaven. Are we being half-hearted today or are we being fully committed to the work that God would have us to do? He wants the whole heart and interest or he will have none. 
their influence tells decidedly, unmistakably, in favor of the truth or against it. They gather with Jesus or they scatter abroad. An unsanctified wife is the greatest curse that a minister can have. Is that a hard statement to have to hear? Do we have unsanctified wives and unsanctified ministers currently? What is to occur if someone <clears throat> unsanctified is giving a message? Are they pointing the people heavenward? up that narrow path or are they directing people onto the broad path those servants of god that have been and are still so situated as to have this withering influence at home should double their prayers and their watchfulness take a firm decided stand and not let this darkness press them down they should cleave closer to God to be firm and decided and rule well their own house and live so that they can have the approbation of God and the watch care of the angels. But if they yield to the wishes of their unconsecrated companions, the frown of God is brought upon the dwelling. The ark of God cannot abide in the house because their countenance and uphold them in their wrong. If we countenance and hold on to wrongs, is this not telling us that the ark with its mercy seat will be taken from us? Do we not recall the issues that occurred when the ark was brought forth from Shiloh and was lost for that seven-month period during the time when Eli was priest. Did Eli properly rule his house? Did Eli properly instruct his sons? Were his sons representative of the character of Christ? What happened to his sons, Hophni and Phineas? And what happened? They were slain. Repeat, please. Sorry. They were slain in the war. They were slain in the battle. <clears throat> and what happened to that which they took from Shiloh? The Philistines, they took it. Because uh, the glory of God had uh, departed from them. Do we not see that in the same manner, if we are choosing to study as apostates would, thinking that we know more of the word of God because of our extensive intelligence, that we can change the plain meanings of the word of God to fit our beliefs, that we are abandoning Miller's rules that we are abandoning the plain understanding of the scripture, that we are abandoning what God himself would ordain for us to understand. Do we seek to have the frown of God brought upon our homes? <clears throat> a 
Okay. Comment that's in the chat. Help me. Ex explain this for me, please. Uh, what I meant is just as uh, a false spouse can drag us down, so can so can our cherished sins and our, our ideas that don't line up with God's word and God's standard, and they need to be put aside. Okay. Now, why does Ezekiel 10 come to mind? No, no, I meant, I meant, I meant Ezra 10, where it talks about the separation from the strange wives. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Our God is a jealous God. It is a fearful thing to trifle with him. Does any of us today have the power, the right, or the mental ability to be able to disagree with our creator. It's not really meant that we need to worship on the Sabbath. We can worship on any day, right? Oh, we're Christians. We honor the day that Christ rose from the dead. No, that's not according to everything in the Old Testament, but we're New Testament Christians. The Old Testament does not apply to us. Is that correct? Our God. Well, if it applied to Christ. Sorry, I was just going to say, if it applied to Christ, it should apply to us. Agreed. <clears throat> Our God is a jealous God. It is a fearful thing to trifle with him. Anciently, Achan coveted a golden wedge and a Babylonian garment and secreted them. And all Israel suffered and they were driven before their enemies. And when Joshua inquired the cause, the Lord said, up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord of God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. Achan had sinned, and God destroyed him and all his household with all they possessed and wiped the curse from Israel. Where are we today, Israel? Where are we today, brothers and sisters? Are we choosing to tear down others? Or are we choosing to support them, to lift up their hands by prayer and supplication? Not only by our effort before the throne of God, but in our very attitude and the very words we speak. <laughs> I saw that the Israel of God must arise and renew their strength in God. By renewing and keeping their covenant with him. Have we yet entered into a covenant with God? If we have entered into such a covenant... 
then why are we not choosing to renew our strength and keep that covenant? If we are not entering into this covenant, then why are we here? Covetousness, selfishness, love of money, and the love of the world are all through the ranks of Sabbath keepers. These evils are destroying the spirit of sacrifice among God's people. Those that have, have, have this covetousness in their hearts are not aware of it. It has gained upon them imperceptibly. And unless it is rooted out, their destruction will be as sure as Achan's. Many have taken the sacrifice from God's altar. They love the world. They love its gain and they love its increase. And unless there is an entire change in them, they will perish with the world. God has lent them their means. It is not their own. But God has made them his stewards. And because of this, they call it their own and hoard it up. But oh, how quick when the prospering hand of God is removed from them. It is all snatched away in a moment. There must be a sacrificing for God, a denying of self for the truth's sake. Oh, how weak and frail is man, how puny his arm. I saw that soon the loftiness of man is to be brought down and the pride of man humble. Kings and nobles, rich and poor alike shall bow and the withering plagues of God shall fall upon them. Do we wish at this time to let the plagues fall upon us? No. Okay. If the answer is no, then what are we called to do? Are we not called to repent, to confess our sins to one another, to be prepared for that which God would do within us. Men of God chosen to be shepherds of the flock must continually feel the responsibility of their mission, the burden of their work. The burden cannot be safely laid off for a moment. Sobriety, solemnity should rest upon men who are a spectacle to the world to angels and to men. Yet God is not pleased with his laborers being gloomy, desponding, and unbelieving. For in thus doing, they are a cloud instead of being a sunbeam diffusing light. Letter 11, 1870. <clears throat> now, what's interesting about this, this letter is written to a party that has the same surname as mine. Do I know this party? No, not that I'm aware of. This party lived in Maine. Most of my family had come from Ohio and before that from Connecticut and before that from England on my father's side. So when I'm reading something like this, I am not pointing fingers I'm having to have all fingers point directly at me. <clears throat> Brother Howard, you have not seen the deficiencies in your character, which, unless overcome, disqualify you from building up the cause and producing healthy action in the body of believers. Where your influence has been felt the most, the cause of God languished, and there has been felt the greatest discouragement. You feel at liberty to be guided by your feeling. If you are disinclined to labor, you will not. If you do not feel like speaking and praying, you will not. Those who wait for their shepherd to move forward suffer loss. 
the brethren have not felt free to move independently of you while you profess to be God's minister and to feed the flock. You do not feel free the, ne the necessity of disciplining L. M. Howard and bringing him up to the work, whether he feels it or not. You do not move from principle, but, but from impulse. When you do get aroused, you then exercise yourself with some energy, showing that you possess the power to do very much more than you have done. Now, what struck me as I prepared this for this, this morning's meeting, L.M. Howard are my mother's initials. <clears throat> you have not been willing to be instructed. You have scorned the advice and the help of others when it was just what you needed. Brothers and sisters, do we find ourselves in that same situation? Are we scorning the advice? Are we scorning help? Are we turning our backs on those that would help us the most? When God's servants have come to Maine, you have felt jealous, suspicious, and rebellious. Your spirit was enough to dishearten and discourage if you did not say a word, but your words have been so have been such as to create sympathy in others for you and to cause distrust to exist in their minds in regard to the servants of God. While they have been trying to help you, you have been hurting them and making their labors hard. You have not been grateful and horrible, humble. God has been displeased with your course. God's servants could not accomplish but little until your influence was counteracted and gotten out of the way. As soon as your, your case was taken a hold of, from very necessity to make their labors a success, you have maintained a sullen indifference, a stubborn, resistant position, resisting all their efforts for your good. Your language has been, I will not be driven. May this not be said of us at this time. Are we then to be at liberty to believe that we are being put upon? Are we at liberty to be backbiting, to gossip, to believe that we know better than anyone else? No, we are not at liberty to do that. <clears throat> Zechariah 1, verse 5. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. Are we not being given warning upon warning, opportunity upon opportunity, to be able to repent from doing that which we should not do, to be able to enter into the rest that God would have us enter into? Which path do we choose today? <clears throat> Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, 
which is the month Shabbat. In the second year of Darius, <laughs> came the word of the Lord upon unto Zechariah, the son of Ber Berechiah, the son of Ido, the prophet, saying, now, if I've understood this correctly, this occurred about the 15th of February of 519 BC in the Julian calendar. Correct. That is correct. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for the confirmation. I saw by night <clears throat> and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood upon among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him there were were there red horses, speckled and white, or bay and white, depending on the translator. So just a note here, getting yes. back to the previous verse. Okay. <clears throat> um so um so here in, in Zechari Zechariah chapter uh, 1, verse 7, it's going to give us this date. Now, in, in chapter 1, verse 1, um, it didn't give us a precise date, right? So you had uh, the eighth month and the second year. So this, but this is going to be specific. So this is, uh, you know, almost to the 12th month. Um, so he's going to have this call initially, right? His first vision. And then he's going to have this, this other one about four months later. So we don't know almost four months later. We just don't know. It, it's sometimes assumed it says in the eighth month in the second year, that it's probably the first day of the eighth month, but, uh, we don't know exactly. So it's just a, just a note there. Okay. <clears throat> so we have a date, a specific date, when this vision of the horseman is being given. Then I said, my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. So is it the angel that is responding? <clears throat> In verse 10. Or is it the man that's upon the red horse? Are they different or are they the same? The next verse gives us a clue. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, the, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. So we have a man upon a red horse. We have a man that stood among the myrtle trees. They are both a message. Would we have a problem with that? Well, um, so in Zechariah, you're going to have these... Um, uh, these horses, right, show up a bit later as well. Um, 
So it's hard to say. So you're saying that that these are messages. This is a message. I would I would say that that's the way it looks. Okay. So what message would it be? I don't know yet. Okay. <clears throat> What's so important about the myrtle trees? And why are we given this symbol of a red horse? Well, the red horse can refer to persecution. Right. What does the bay horse represent, the speckled horse? Okay, so my understanding of, of this, um, the vision of the horseman here, is you have um, uh, these various horses, right? Right. And um, so these I always understood to be referring back to the, uh, you know, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome, to the persecutions that we're going to come because um, you're going to have the chariots as well. Okay. In, chapter, in chapter six. Now in chapter six, it seems pretty clear that these are referring to um, because there's going to be uh, the first chariot, which is red horses, the second chariot, black horses, the third chariot, white horses, and the fourth chariot, grizzled and bay, um, assuming that these are, um, uh, you know, uh, what's the word? I can't think of the word offhand. Um, I can't think the name of that color. But anyway, it would be um, uh, like a multicolored horse. What's the name for that again? You mean like a speckled horse? Yeah, but um, uh, what they call a paint uh, now, right? So there, there's another other names for them is too. Uh, no, I just can't think of the name. It just escapes my mind. But but anyway, the idea is that um, uh, the red horses and are on these these chariots that have horses, right? And these chariots, there's four chariots. The four is Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, Rome has two different colors, grizzled and bay. Right? So the grizzled is um, like a paint, right? Um, you, know, you could say piebald. Um, and then a bay is, uh, you know, whether what this other what this means in Hebrew, I don't know. I know what it means in English. Um, but the point is that when you're going to have these uh, horses, it's it's saying that the black horses are going to go forth into the north country, the white go forth after them, and the grizzled go forth towards the south country, and the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. So. My understanding is that this represents uh, the, the fourth chariot is Rome, but it has two phases, pagan and papal. Uh, and Babylon doesn't go forth because it's it's already gone forth. Right. And you're in the time of Media Persia. Right. So that's that's the time of the black horse horses or the chariot with the black horses. But I don't know, you know, so going back to chapter one, I mean, it needs to be understood in, the, in this context. Um, but to say that they're messages, I never thought about that before. I don't know if that's helpful or not. But Well, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at Zechariah because this is the last of the books that Mrs. White 
had stated that need to be compared with the book of Daniel. Right, and it's the one I've studied most uh, in, in all what we call the minor prophets, not counting Daniel as a minor prophet. Um, and, and mostly because there's so much connections in the symbolism here to Revelation. Right. Right, and then also you got, you know, the... Um, you know, the lamp stands and all that stuff, right? So that's why I've spent so much time in Zechariah. Okay. <clears throat> but yeah, I don't know. I've never thought about it as being messages. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro through the earth and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Okay, so with this with this verse, it's Zechariah 1, 11. Right. Now, uh, it's 111 days from the, the beginning of the eighth month to the 24th day of uh, the 11th month. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, because that's going to be, uh, so it's going to be 111 days, which, you know, we have that symbol in our lines dealing with January 11th. Exactly. So I don't know what that means, but it's just a note. As we take this verse as it reads, we are told, we have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Is the earth at rest right now? Um, well, here, if we look at the word rest here. Okay. Um, uh, the word is... Um, I'm just not looking at the right number here. It means to be quiet, be tranquil, be at peace, be quiet, rest, lie still, be undisturbed. Um, uh, to show quietness, to be quiet, to cause quietness, right? Um, so it's it's inactive, right? It sitteth still. Uh, that word yashav means like to sit down and so, you know, I, I don't know. It depends in what context that we're trying to understand what it means. It's at rest. It doesn't seem to be, but maybe in this context, the earth is sitting still and at rest. Just depends what that means in, in this context. Because these are going to be, you know, my understanding is these are going to be, uh, war or judgments upon upon the earth right <clears throat> exactly. you said the messages i took them as like judgments and so at this point this is just like the calm before the storm sort of idea i would think right are we not dealing here with a situation that could be just before midnight and the midnight cry for our time. Well, it could be. Now, of course, Zechariah 1, verse 12, because um, that's pretty important in understanding this. It says, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, The Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years. So first, we see that this is a how long question. Right. And these happen in, in specific incidents. Um, uh, when you're dealing with, with a prophetic uh, um, reference, right? So here in this case, just hang on. Um, So you have um, 
I mean, there's lots of different how long questions, but I'm saying when it comes to a time question in the sense of sort of prophetic and that a time is mentioned. So obviously you have that in Daniel chapter 12, right? Daniel 12, verse six. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And, and then it's going to give you a time, a time, times and a half a time, right? Right. And, and then you're going to also have, even in Revelation, uh, um, where it's going to ask, ask the question, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood to the, on them that dwell upon the earth? And the answer to that um, is uh, going to be addressed a bit later, but basically that's going to be the 1260 years. So there's going to be, you know that that's at the end of that 1260, based upon all the other things that are said. Um and right. but this this how long has to do with the 70. Now this 70 is the 70 years that the temple lays in ruins. Right. It's not referring to the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. Okay, but didn't didn't the temple fall into ruin in 586? Yeah. And so this is this is so when it says these three score and ten years, it's referring to the 70 years for the temple. Now the 70 years for the temple is not ended yet. Right. So that means that the angel in giving this answer understands that this is going to be a period of 70 years. It has not yet been a period of 70 years. Right. This is in 519 BC. And so, you know, it's it's a period of, uh, you know, 67 years at this point. And in, in Zechariah 7, uh, uh, you're also going to have the same period of 70 years being mentioned in Zechariah 7, verse 5, and, and it repeats exactly the same phrase. Um, uh, where it says, um, um, speak unto the people of the land and unto the priest, saying, when ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those 70 years, it actually is these 70 years, because Hebrew doesn't have uh, a word for these or those. There's no distinction. Uh, did ye fast at all unto me, even unto me? And now this is going to be um, a couple of years later, but this is still a year before the 70 years ends. So at this point, they, they still haven't, it's not completed. The 70 years is still not completed. And the fast of the fifth and seventh month has to do with the destruction of the temple in the fifth month and the, the murder of Gedaliah in the seventh month. So, so this 70-year period is the same 70-year period as in chapter one. Um, but in chapter one, it's going to have that how long question. And we know that Ellen White compares the 70 years Babylonian captivity to the 1260 that ends in 1798. Right. So, so this 70 years also could be compared to the 1260, even though it's just for the temple. And if we're comparing it to the 1260, are we also not comparing it with the seven times of Leviticus 25 and 26? Yeah. And so in, in this case, when we deal with the temple aspect, um, we know there's 46 years from the end of the 1260 in 1798 to 1844. Right. So just like you have these periods of 70 years, you also have periods of 25, 20 years and 1260 years. So just, just as a thought, as we're coming close to the close of our time together today, mm -hmm. here we have this vision. On the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month of Sibat, in the second year of Darius, we have this fifteenth of February of five nineteen BC, right? Yeah. Do we have anything in our time, in our lines, that also refers to the fifteenth of February? Well, we have uh, obviously um, Miller's birth, and and then on his 
was it his 16th birthday that in 1798 that the Pope's taken captive. Okay. So it's interesting, is it not, that this vision has an interrelation both to Father Miller and to the Pope being taken captive. Mm -hmm. Okay, we will return to this again this next week because our time for this week is now done. Consider these points that we have addressed. See what we're able to come up with <clears throat> as far as interrelation with all of these 70-year periods, especially this one, with what we are currently addressing. Does anyone else have any comments or questions at this time? All right, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the multiple times that you have been instructing us, that you have been showing us where our faith is to lie. We ask you now, Father, for your blessing on this Sabbath. <clears throat> Help us to understand. Help us to be guided. Help us now to do that that you would have us to do. May your will be done. May we walk humbly before you so that we may do that which you would have us to do so that your name and your character may be glorified. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, now and always in Jesus' name. Amen.